Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join today's SmartCap webinar. Today, we're covering a particularly uh, interesting topic, which is how to help uh, fatigued employees within your organizations by focusing on getting the business process right. My name is Dan Bonges. I'm the CTO for SmartCap Technologies. I'm glad to be with you here today. Just a little bit of housekeeping up front. Um, please keep a note that today's webinar is being recorded, both the audio and the slides you see on your screen. That means a couple of things. Firstly, you don't need to scramble and write down notes. Everything will be available. But secondly, what that also means is if you choose to ask a question using your audio, uh, your question via audio will be recorded as well. So please keep that in mind. We'll be posting this up on our LinkedIn page shortly after we're finished today. So let's get to it. When we're talking about fatigued employees, first I just want to clarify what we mean by that. And the definition for this is usually something that's handled fairly informally. Uh, and the first time that we really are asked to, asked to meet some sort of a definition includes when we're, we're involved in some sort of a fatigue related incident. So an, a professional driver or equipment operator who's involved in a fatigue related incident within a business usually will fall into the category of a fatigued employee that might need some assistance. Also in some cases, far less than is, is desirable, but individuals might self-report that they're struggling fatigue or during some sort of face-to-face -face interactions, a supervisor or a, another colleague might identify that a person looks particularly tired. And so these would be the informal definitions of how we would typically recognize a fatigued employee. This becomes a little bit more objective uh, when we enter into the world of fatigue monitoring. Uh, and so an individual in the, a fatigue monitoring space who repeatedly and consistently reaches the point of receiving fatigue alarms, that individual would therefore fall into this definition of a fatigued employee that needs some assistance. And again, in that world of fatigue monitoring, we would, rather than referring to the employee as fatigued, we may refer to them as a high fatigue alarm rate or a high alarm rate individual. Now, regardless of how we define fatigued employees, an employee understanding that assistance is available to them will have a certain perception about that assistance process. And especially when more formal controls like fatigue monitoring are introduced, the perceived process is unfortunately fairly severe. The typical perception of a fatigue monitoring initiative or a more heavy focus on fatigue management in general falls under the perception that if you're tired within this business, if you're routinely fatigued, find somewhere else to work. If you're tired, you're fired. Now, this isn't true. We've not come across businesses who adopt this approach, but nonetheless, this is the perceived process from the employee's perspective. And that perception is something we want to keep in mind as we go through and develop a formal business process. Now, some businesses are forced, their hand is forced to go through and improvise a process. And that typically will come about again when we're faced with the unfortunate event of a fatigue incident. And so that improv improvised process usually will include fairly informal definitions. And so this would be a supervisor who's giving fairly subjective views on whether or not someone constantly is reporting themselves as fatigued. As part though of that improvised process of assisting people, we usually find that the nature of the conversations with the employees is more focused on discipline. And so an example would be something along the lines of, why is it that you're struggling to manage your own fatigue? Why can't you arrive prepared for shift? And so rather than being a focus on assistance, the tone comes across very much in a disciplinary nature. For businesses that are doing their very best to assist employees that are routinely fatigued, they will usually get a health team involved if their business is large enough to have an internal health team. They may often though refer straight to a sleep center. And so this falls into the perception when someone is fatigued, this must be and must only be a sleep problem. And depending how much time people have spent studying this issue, they may be familiar with sleep apnea and so think sleep apnea must be the cause. From our perspective, this is a bit too sudden and a bit too severe. 
but nonetheless that tends to be involved in an improvised process. When all else fails in this fairly abbreviated process, typically the end result though for the employee is if they continue to be fatigued or demonstrate symptoms of fatigue, is that they then enter into some sort of performance management process, which again is more disciplinary in nature rather than looking to assist them. And so what I wanted to do before we talk about what we've seen as best practice for implementing a process like this is highlight just the very nature of fatigue and how complicated it can be. Identifying why an individual is fatigued is necessary when we want to assist them, but fatigue itself can be quite complicated. So I've drawn on four examples that we've seen in the past, which are four of many, many examples, just to show how varied the underlying causes of fatigue can be. The first example is a mid-20s female, half marathon runner who eats healthy, um, who from all, all points of view looks to be a picture of health where you would see no general assumption that there'd be a fatigue risk. But this young lady received a whole bunch of fatigue alarms each and every day, and during her night shift work, she received just the normal amount of fatigue alarms. And so what was confusing was here is a healthy person who's getting far more fatigue alarms than normal. And what's even stranger is that her fatigue alarms are happening during the daytime. It turned out that the reason these fatigue alarms were happening was eye strain. This young lady was using the company issued tinted safety glasses for her daytime eyewear instead of polarized lenses or professional um, sun glare lenses. And so the, the eye strain due to the glare of the sun was bringing on the onset of fatigue much faster for this individual. By simply making sure she had access to a pair of polarized glasses, what happened almost immediately is her fatigue alarms during day shift went away and she no longer fell into that definition of a fatigued individual. A second example is a middle-aged man who had, from a, from a health perspective, generally a good bill of health, who again, you wouldn't see as a picture of an individual suspected of being regularly fatigued. This particular individual though, had more fatigue alarms at nighttime than in, the, than in daytime, which is fairly commonplace, but both during daytime and nighttime, they had a whole bunch more fatigue alarms than anyone else within their, within their work group. As they started to solve this riddle, they sent the individual to a doctor, and as part of that doctor's visit, they filled out a form. And one of the answers they ticked was, no, it does not hurt when I pee. And to that particular doctor, that ruled out a urinary tract infection. What that doctor may have forgotten, however, is that nine out of 10 urinary tract infections have no external symptoms at all. So it certainly doesn't hurt when you pee, but they do have the effect of increasing or excess daytime fatigue. And so it took several more months of trying all different sorts of things and sleep patterns for a second doctor's visit to reveal that this individual had a non-symptomatic urinary tract infection, which was cleared up with, with some antibiotics and the fatigue alarms went away. The third example was a moderately healthy individual um, who was a fairly heavy smoker and smoking's not particularly good for your health at all, um, but it doesn't have enormous effects on fatigue risk profiles, generally speaking. But for this individual, the last cigarette of the day was moments before they went to bed at night. And what we know is cigarettes being a stimulant, having a cigarette within the 90 minutes prior to voluntary rest very much impacts the quality of sleep. So with this individual, all they needed to do was change when they took that last cigarette of the day, and their sleep quality improved. And when they made that change again, the fatigue alarms went away. The last one, much like the first, was an individual who was a picture of health. This was a late twenties male, um, fit as a fiddle, who, who lifted weights as, as their primary form of exercise. It turned out though, despite being an extremely healthy individual, this person was doing most of their lifting after shift before they went to bed. And much like the cigarette example, it turned out that the extreme exertion during this weightlifting prior to sleep impacted how quickly they got to sleep and the quality of their sleep. This individual made a small change, 
they started doing their workouts before they went to work instead of after. So they got the same total amount of sleep, but it was much better quality sleep. These four examples, as I said, are four of many examples, just to highlight the fact that identifying the underlying cause of excess fatigue isn't trivial and it's not always involved in just going to a doctor or just going to a sleep specialist. And so any formal business process needs to recognize how complicated or fickle fatigue is uh, so that working through the process can help to identify that underlying cause and genuinely provide assistance. We talked before about the informal or impromptu sort of assistance programs that businesses tend to put in place. Um, but there are some good strong motivations for formalizing this process. And the first one is about being consistent and about being fair. And that's having very clear criteria for escalation through the process. Now this has made a whole bunch easier in the world of real-time fatigue monitoring when you are talking about hard numbers and clear facts about fatigue risk. But even in the world without fatigue monitoring, it's possible to establish clear criteria for escalating through an assistance process where it clearly defines when assistance is needed and when it is not. By applying these clear criteria, not only is, is your assistance process fair to all employees, but the fairness of it will improve the acceptance of whatever initiative you're doing, whether it's a fatigue monitoring initiative or just a greater focus on fatigue management in general. By formalizing the assistance process, we also take away the problems that can come about where individuals who need to be part of that assistance don't know what their job is. And so by clearly defining roles and responsibilities, operational supervisors will understand where they fit into the process. So will health teams and so will senior managers if some sort of alternate duty type options need to be implemented. One of the other reasons for formalizing the assistance process is anytime businesses put together these sorts of formal processes, there's usually a predefined path of consultation that's involved. And even if it's not some sort of external like union consultation, there may be workforce consultation. But in any case, before formal processes are signed off, they tend to receive a lot more scrutiny through the approval process. And it's that scrutiny that's going to make sure that the assistance process is not only fair and reasonable, but also that you're going to get the most or best benefit for assisting your employees. Also by just simply going through the process of documenting and formalizing the process, what it will do is it will highlight gaps within your business of things that you, you may have thought were there that weren't there. And for example, this might say, we don't have a mechanism for employees to directly contact the on-site nurse. And so by highlighting simple gaps um, is another benefit that you'll get uh, from formalizing the assistance process. Now in the real world, whether it's an informal process or the more rigorous fatigue monitoring type approach, the first step in identifying fatigued individuals and really genuinely the first step in starting to help them is interaction with the supervisor. And if you do have the time, I encourage you to go back and look online. Our webinar number one was focused entirely on the nature of the interaction between supervisors and individuals when they receive a fatigue alarm. But how it plays out from, a, from an assistance process point of view is that this supervisor intervention or interaction really needs to take on a positive tone. This can't be a disciplinary conversation. This has to be a conversation focused on assisting individuals and if, if possible, assisting them with self-management, managing the risk before they get to, to the point of a micro sleep. This is a great opportunity also to focus on fatigue education, reminding people of the best practice for preparing for shift, asking them questions about the lifestyle choices, which really then becomes the beginning of a dialogue towards solving this complicated fatigue riddle. It's important though to remember, it's not the supervisor's job to ask 100 questions and solve the fatigue riddle one-on-one, -on -one, but by having a positive tone and a caring approach to this first interaction, this is where supervisors can open up an employee to starting to work towards exploring this themselves. 
So again, as an example process of what we've seen throughout businesses around the world as what we would consider best practice, an example here would begin with some sort of one-on-one -on -one supervisor engagement. And if at all possible, the types of one-on-one -on -one supervisor engagement would be a little different from day to day. So this might be a genuine pause at work to simply say, now that we're paused, let's have a conversation about why these fatigue alarms are happening regularly or why you're reporting yourself as fatigued regularly. If that doesn't reveal something trivial like some stressors at home or an inability to get good sleep or some problem with some camp if it's a fly-in, fly-out operation, if this engagement doesn't identify the cause and lead to solutions, the next step in the process usually would be escalated to a superintendent level, the next level above a supervisor. And that conversation will go a whole lot better if it's empowered by some data. If you have a fatigue monitoring system in place, grab the data from that. If you have a telematics or fleet management system that allows you to record when people have chosen a voluntary fatigue break, use that data. Whatever it is, that conversation is better empowered by data so that you can reinforce with the individual, this is why we believe you meet the criteria and that's why we're having the conversation. But again, this discussion with the superintendent level is there to see if it's plausible to identify the low hanging fruit, the, the fairly obvious reasons why an individual may not be prepared for shift or may be excessively fatigued that they might not have been willing to share with their supervisor. Now, if you're working in the world of a fatigue monitoring initiative, a great next step in this process is to go back to your vendor like SmartCap and get them to confirm the validity of this data, to run their eyes over it in detail for however many hours, days, months, or years the individual's been using the system, to review it to make sure that there's no issues, and to gain further insights that might help in solving the fatigue riddle. So an example, as before, might be this individual, yes, is more regularly fatigued, but it's only happening during day shift, like that first example of the young lady who needed just some polarized sunglasses. Those sorts of insights will guide the next step, which is typically referral to some sort of health professional, whether that's a health team on site or a local clinic, all the way through to a general practitioner or family doctor. Now with that referral, if your business is referring the individual to a GP, to a doctor, it's important that the, the doctor understands the context for this why. So any sort of data that you've gathered, any sort of facts or testimonials, reports from supervisors, all of this information is going to be useful for a medical professional to make some informed decisions rather than starting with a blank slate. That medical assessment may be that next step which may involve things like urine tests to identify non-symptomatic urinary tract infections, it may involve blood tests, um, all the way through if that's unable to solve the riddle moving towards some sort of a formal sleep assessment to identify some sleep hygiene issues. The last step in, in a process like this as best practice may be while we continue to work through and try to identify where the problem is coming about from, it's let's look at a temporary roster change or alternate duties. So this might be the option to say, if a person's having a lot of fatigue alarms, or reporting some self-fatigue at night time to move them onto a permanent daytime roster until the problem is resolved. Or if they're in a very high risk role, it might be moving them to other alternate duties until the problem is resolved. Now, in terms of this process, it might seem involved and like a lot of work to put in place, but there are genuine benefits in taking the time. The first benefit is that you're going to formalize how you fairly, reasonably, and consistently help your employees, which really needs to be number one. But there are other great business outcomes as well. What we typically see, because we have hard facts about how this all plays out, is when your employees combine some self-management of fatigue using some real-time information, and at the same time, when things beep too many times, the supervisor gets involved, we see on average a 43 or so percent reduction in the fatigue alarm rate in the space of 12 months. That's a fantastic result, and that comes about by give, empowering people with information. But if in addition to that, if you develop a process like we've talked about today, you can see much better gains, much, reduction, much greater reduction in fatigue alarms, 
And for those individuals, that four to seven percent of each workforce who tends to fall into this category of a higher risk individual, a high alarm rate individual, for those you'll see greater than a 70% reduction in the alarm rate for those individuals. That's the real measurable outcome, the benefit of putting in place a proper assistance process to identify and to assist the individuals to solve the problem. That's all we had to talk about today. So I'll open it up to the floor if anyone has any questions. As part of this GoToMeeting forum, there's a questions box, so you can feel free to put your hand up or type out a question. So I'll just give sort of 20 seconds if someone wants to put their hand up. If not, I've got a, a few questions that I've prepared in advance. Okay, so I'll volunteer some questions first. When talking about this topic, the most common question we get asked is, how, how often will this process be needed? How many of my employees, whether I use fatigue monitoring or just keep my ear to the ground and implement systems that allow people to self-report, how many of my employees are going to need help like this? How many will I have to send to the doctor? How many will need alternate duties? The answer is fairly consistent, and that's four to seven percent of every workforce will typically represent around 60 to 70% of all risk events or, or all elevated fatigue moments within that business. And so a good round figure to adopt is consider that at any given point in time, somewhere around two to 4% of employees would be working through this assistance process. But because this is dynamic and changes from week to week or month to month, if you look back at a snapshot of an entire year, probably looking at a number somewhere closer to five to 7% of employees will have needed to go into some part of this assistance process. But because in many cases, the underlying cause of fatigue is fairly straightforward to identify and remedy, most of the individuals who get into this process will never make it down to the more escalated help of sleep, sleep center referrals and so forth. It will have been resolved much more quickly. Another question we get with all of these different stages in a formal assistance process is how long does it all take? The unfortunate reality is this, we don't know the answer to that and that's because it's so highly dependent on how engaged both the individual who's being assisted is and how your management team is in, in engagement with the assistance process. And so a fairly rapid progression through this process can take as little as a couple of weeks, um, but potentially, and in the real world, where people have other or competing priorities, an individual may be working through this assistance process for up to a, a handful of months. And so again, that's a good reminder of the benefit of having not just your employees, but management team engaged in a process like this and understanding the benefits, because the more engaged people are, the quicker we can move people through and get them the help that they need. As I said, one of the sort of first, one of the earlier questions that we receive, which tends to be one of the later steps in a formal process, is say, can we bypass all of this? And if we have an individual who's fatigued, can we just move them to permanent day shift? And that's a valid question, um, but the question kind of ignores the reality of how complicated fatigue is. And so because we know some individuals are more fatigued during day shift rather than night shift, some individuals are fatigued during both because of, as that example, a non-symptomatic urinary tract infection. Other individuals are, are experiencing high fatigue because of when they exercise, not that they don't exercise. And so trivializing the solution as a panacea, can we just put everyone on a day shift and solve the problem? The simple answer to that is no. The nuance of fatigue is best informed with some sort of real-time fatigue monitoring technology and second best informed by having some sensible things within your business that allow you to keep your ear to the ground so that those facts, the facts relevant to the individual you're helping, feed into how that how that you can assist them and not treat everyone as the same. 
So there's no questions up on the board. Those are the, the most common questions we received. So that's all we have to co cover for today. I did, however, want to highlight uh, two weeks from now, we're having webinar number four. And this is going to be looking at the numbers. So over the years, our customers around the world have driven billions of miles. We've got hundreds of millions of hours of data to look at, and I've spent a decade pulling apart this data. So I wanted to take the opportunity to share what we've learned from the perspective of actionable insights, learnings from objective measures of fatigue and alertness that can inform businesses with what works, what doesn't work, and what changes they can make to de-risk their business further. So with that, that's all we have for you today. I hope you've taken something valuable from today's webinar. And as I said, everything's been recorded. So shortly we'll be posting this up online if you want to share this with your colleagues. So thank you again for taking the time out of your day and I wish you all a great day or evening.